Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 4. If you look very closely at the context of the book of Deuteronomy, you'll see that Moses preaches three sermons throughout this book. The first sermon is found in chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 4, verse 43. The second sermon comes 444 to 2619. And the third one is 271 through 3020. The first sermon is what God has done for Israel. The second one is what God expects of Israel. And the third one is what God will do for Israel. So if you have a little bit of time, look at those chapters. And I've picked <clears throat> part of the first sermon to look at this evening with you. I'd like to start reading at chapter 4, verse 1. Now therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you. For do, now listen to this, for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers hath given you. Moses won't get there. He knows that. Joshua is about ready to take over. And he had prayed to God and he says, I'd like to see that. I'd like to go see that land. And he said, God was upset with me. He was angry with me because I did something I wasn't supposed to do. So that's what is leading up to this point of this message. <clears throat> So he tells the people, now you're going to be under a new leader. And this is what you need to do. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you. Neither shall you diminish aught from it. That ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that follow Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye did not cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments even as the Lord my God commanded me. Otherwise... You got the message that I got. <clears throat> and it wasn't my message. It was the Lord's message. <clears throat> and he went on from there. He said, even as the Lord thy God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land, whether ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. This is your testimony as to who you're following. You're following my commandments. The message comes from the Lord to Moses to these people. Surely this is a great nation, is a wise and understanding people, is what you're going to give to them as you obey what I tell you to do. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them? as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon for him, him for. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? That's going to be what the people see in them as they do what they're supposed to do. Now look, verse 9. Only take heed to yourself and keep thy soul diligently lest you forget 
the things which you have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of your life, but teach them to your sons and your sons' sons. Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in the Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children." Now what I'm doing is I'm going to break this thing down a little bit for you. This is one of the things I'm trying to teach our young people. Bible analysis. You look at a verse and you tear it apart. You look at it word by word, piece by piece. Get the meaning of every word in that. If you remember a long time ago when I was filling in in Sunday school, I taught a few lessons on words are important. Amen. And this is a problem in a lot of churches today. We're not taught what the words meant in the original language. Pastor mentioned this morning about the word changes since 1611. But if we are going to go by languages of 1611 instead of the original language, we're not going to get the truth. We need to understand what God says and what he said and what he really inspired people to write. And our young people are learning to tear the verses apart, aren't we, Matt? Piece by piece. Ask Josiah. Ask these young ladies in Asa whether they're learning how to study the Bible. I was surprised one evening. I said, did you learn anything tonight? Yeah. Did you ever see that in that verse before? No. How often do we go through? Many churches don't have that opportunity. They don't have preachers and teachers and this is why we need to be careful of the teachers that we appoint as a church. Because we can't appoint somebody as a teacher if all they're able to do is read accordingly. I think Brother Johnson brings this out pretty well in Sunday school class. Because we need to know what it means. We need to know what's the capital C stand for that I ask you guys. Context. We need to know context. We need to know words. So the first thing I'd like for us to look at is the very first two verses. The first two verses are instructions. He tells them, listen Israel, to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you. Now that idea of listening is not just here. It's here. I know you don't have any trouble hearing me. Or do you? Are you hearing here? Or is your heart open that you hear here? When the pastor stands up here and he teaches, do you hear here? Do you hear here? We need to ask ourselves that question. Every time we come, am I going to hear here? You know you go out the door and you say, good message, pastor. And by the time you get home, you've forgotten what was said. That's hearing here. But it's not hearing here. So he says, look, he says, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you, the things I teach you about how to do what's right according to what God says. Now if you listen to what this world tells you is right and what's wrong, you're going to get things reversed. You go by what this government says is right and wrong, you're going to get it reversed. 
We need to observe what this book says is right and wrong, and that's the only thing that's going to get us anywhere in life. Which I tell you to observe. That you may live. That you might have a successful life. That you might have the life that God wants you to have. Do what he wants you to do. Coming to church on a Sunday morning isn't going to get the job done. Getting to church Sunday night, that's not going to get the job done. Coming on a Wednesday night, not going to get the job done. What's going to get the job done is with what you hear, here, and not here. Not just because you fill a seat in a pew. That's not going to get the job done. It's what you do here. And that's what he's telling these people. Here, here, so you get it right. So that you have the life that God wants you to have. God wanted them to go in there and they wandered around for 40 years and they died off and their kids now have the opportunity. They're getting ready to cross over the Jordan and go in and take possession of that land which the Lord God, your fathers, has given you. He didn't say go in there and take a chance at it. He didn't say in there, go and fight and maybe you'll have enough power to win it. He said, I've already given it to you. All you have to do is go in there. I've got the plan all worked out. Those people, when they had their opportunity to win, God already had the plan worked out, and they said, whoops, we know better than God. Our nation today knows better than God, they think. You know what? We're following in the steps of Israel instead of God and what they had done. And he goes on to say, he shall not add to the word. I want to tell you something. The church, and nobody in the church has a right to make new laws for the church. No, for Christians. There's the guide. He lays out the responsibilities of the church. And one of them is not making rules. He tells what you are supposed to do as a member of a local church. And the problem with churches today is they're not following this book, they're following what man says instead of what God says. And then we sit back and we say, why are we failing? Why don't we see victory? Why are we seeing defeat? Because we're not doing what God said. We're not doing the message that he has in this book. Now you can sit back and we can all sit back all we want to and say, why isn't God giving us anything? Why isn't God doing anything? Why aren't we growing? It's not because of God. God gives the answer to do it. Right here. There are relationships with people out there. Talk to them about the Lord. Don't push them. Talk to them. Let the Holy Spirit work them. And in one of these days, He'll give you that opportunity to go the next step. Don't add to the word which I command you. Don't take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. If the word of God is being preached from this pulpit or from the classes, you have an obligation as a church member and I have an obligation as a church member to do what you hear is taught. You take it home, you look at it, and you see whether or not it's right. And if it is, you're responsible. The preacher's not and the pastor's not. I remember I was pastoring a church <clears throat> one time and deacon come up to me and he said, how long have you been here? And I told him, he says, well, that's an awful long time for a pastor to be in one church. He realized that our numbers right now are only here. Well, it was just about where it was when I had this discussion with him, where it was previously. We did have visitors. 
had five come in and go again because they didn't agree with the teachings of the church. But we're told we have our commandments. We have the book that tells us the instructions. And it's not the pastor, it's not the preacher, it's not the teacher. It's the person who's hearing what is said, studies it, gets the truth, and follows it. Now, the second thing that comes is very important. Verse 3. A reminder and a warning. Got it? A reminder and a warning. Let's go to verse 3. Your eyes. Now look at this. Your eyes have seen. Now look at this. What the Lord did because of Baal Pure for the men, for all the men that follow Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. Now if you go to Numbers chapter 25, we're going to take about a few seconds here and look at what he's talking about. Numbers chapter 25, starting at verse 1. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom, or prostitution, with the daughters of Moab. The Israelites went the way that was right in the eyes of the people. What was accepted by the people. And they went that direction. And they called the people unto, sac unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bow down to their gods. Are you getting it? Are you seeing the picture? You following what's happened? This is what he was talking about back there in our third verse. Alright? Let's move on. And Israel, now look, joined himself to Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of... Now listen to this. God is not going to put up a sin. I don't care if we are a church or not. If we don't do what God wants us to, He will deal with the sin that we allow and we will hold the church, or He will hold the church responsible for not dealing with sin that's in there, involved in a church. The Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and the Lord said to Moses, Take thou all the heads of the people, hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. Show them I'm not putting up with it. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Now listen to this. Slay every one of his men that were joined unto Baal Pure. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle in the congregation. And when Pilate the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it. He rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through <clears throat> the man of Israel and the woman through her belly unto so this plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Now listen to this closely, very closely. And those that died in the plague were 24,000 people. Now, 
what I want you to see here, these are God's people. They decided they were going to go the way of the world that they were in at that time. And God said, I won't put up with it. Churches don't understand why they have problems in the church. Because they don't deal with a problem as God commanded them to do it. People can live like the devil out in that world and churches won't do a thing about it even though they are members of the church. They can get away with anything they want to and there's no disciplinary action whatsoever. Now, I don't know about you, but my Bible teach, teaches me that we are supposed to separate ourselves from people like that. We don't belong to the world. But we set an example by what we allow going on in our church membership. So now, we go back now to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 4. We now look at the benefit of obedience. We saw the instruction, right? We saw the, remain, the reminder and the warning what happens if you don't obey. And now we're going to see the benefit of obedience. But you who held fast to the Lord in your God are alive today, every one of you. What's that tell you? This is what I do with, the, with our young people. What's it tell you? It tells you that some people were obedient. Okay? Get it. Lock it in. Hold fast to the Lord your God. Those people who did so, they're alive today. Boy, I could stop there, couldn't I? I got news for you. I'm not going to. Every one of you. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should act according to them in the land which you possess. Now, when you go across that Jordan, you walk in that dry land. Brother Johnston talked about this this morning. You walk on that dry land. You see the miraculous help that God will give you to have victory when you go across that water. Don't you think that if God opened up a river so you could... What if we went down here to St. Joe and God said to our pastor, he says, you go down here and you put your feet in that water and that water is going to open up and that water is going to dry and you're going to be able to walk across that river. And if he did it, what would be the message? We've got a powerful pastor, right? Huh? Is that right? Yes or no? You've got a powerful God. Amen. Joshua wasn't the powerful one. Moses proved he wasn't the powerful one. God was the powerful one and he proved it by what he did. God doesn't make a promise that he won't fulfill unless you and I don't do what he wants us to do. It's not that God goes into this with his eyes closed. God already knows how you and I are going to act. He already has the second thing lined up. Here's yes, Here's no. Here's good. Here's bad. Here's victory. Here's what? Failure. So he goes on. Hmm. I forgot what verse I was on. Nah. <clears throat> hmm. Okay. For what great nation is there that is God that has a God? so near it 
and as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon Him. Otherwise, we don't have boundaries as long as we go with the commandments that God gives us. If we stay on that line, we've got victory ahead of us. No matter what we seek to do, as long as it's in the line of this book, we will succeed. We will have victory. What great church we would have if we obeyed that book as a church. And what is the church? The people sitting there and standing here. That's the if. Either victory or failure. What do we show about the God that we are supposed to represent as a church with our lives? That's the question he's saying to those people. Only take heed to yourself. Now look. Take heed to yourself. Look carefully at what you are doing. Don't look at anybody else. How many pastors and how many preachers, how many teachers get the blame for what the church does or doesn't do? You see, the pastor, the preacher, the teacher, they're one person out of the entire church. But who usually gets the blame? The one person standing here and nothing about what is out there. I know from experience. Take heed to yourself. Look at yourself. Don't judge by other people. Judge by your own self. And diligently, you diligently, keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Brethren, if we don't get our children into church, and we don't teach them at home also, we will not have victory in our children. Think about it. We won't have victory. We'll have defeat. Because the next generation is the hope of this church. This church isn't going to go anywhere unless we teach our children the importance of this body. And this city, we are the only church that believes what we believe. And if we aren't Excuse the expression, gutty enough to stand up for what we believe, nobody else is going to do it. If our lives aren't such that people, like he says here, can look at us and see how powerful our God is, we're going down to twos. I don't know how many more years I have. Brother Johnson don't know how many more years he has. Our pastor don't know how many more years he has. You don't know how many years you have. If we don't get our job done now, it may never get done. It's our responsibility. That's what he says in here. And he goes on to say, lest you forget these things your eyes have seen, and lest you depart from your heart from the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren, especially concerning the day that you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words, and that they may learn to fear me and all the days that they live on the earth that they may what? Teach their children. Don't depend on some Sunday school teacher, some preacher, 
some pastor to do the teaching. Parents, it's your responsibility. Number one, show whether or not you are really a, feel that your church is important and be there when that door is open for our Bible studies and messages. And then you go home and you go through your Bible with your children about what they have heard in Sunday school and what they have heard in the pulpit and explain it to them. And if you don't understand it, you get a hold of somebody that can. I keep telling our young people, if you don't understand something, I give them a worksheet. If you don't understand what's in there, you call me. Parents, if you don't understand something that your children are talking to you about, you call me, you call me, you see me in the service over there afterwards, I'll take the time with you. I want them to understand. I want them to be what adults ought to be in their lives. But God richly blessed Israel, but often Israel failed to remember God's blessings and suffered the consequences. In Psalms 78, verse 41, we read, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. In verse 42, we read these sad words that tell us they did not remember His or God's power the day when He redeemed them from the enemy. They forgot. Are we forgetting as a church what God has done for us? You know, the devil's working. He sent that fly. Take a look at what God has done for this church. Folks, I pastored a church down in Arkansas. If they had a church like this, they wouldn't have known how to act. You walked across the floors in that church and you were wondering if the wood was going to hold up to the end of the service. Their heat was a gas heater right here in front of the pastor. The only one that got hot in the church was the pastor while he was standing behind it. They were out there freezing. God's blessed us. God's blessed you with three preachers to teach you no matter whether one was missing or not there was always another one to back it up how many churches has God given back up for the pastor I respect my pastor I don't go to him and tell him what he ought to do I stay out of his business if he wants me he knows where he can reach me. And I'm going to go behind his back and talk about him. He don't deserve that. I've been where he stands, and I know what it does, because I've seen it often. But they failed. And God dealt with their sin, expressing his wrath in order to express his love. Does that sound sort of weird? He did what? He gave his wrath to show them his love. He didn't want them to miss out on the blessings. He wanted to bless them. But unless he dealt with it, and unless we as a church deal with the sin in our churches, we'll never understand how much love God has for us because what we allow to happen with our church members, it will impress other church members who are not strong in the faith. If that church member, it's okay, it's going to be okay with me. I can do it too. And just remember, a church member who has never been disciplined still has a vote in this church. Do you ever stop and think about that? I mean, if the church wanted to get rid of a pastor, all they had to do is go out and call in all these people who never come to church any other time. I've had this happen. And anybody that doesn't like the pastor, they can go out and they can visit all these people and come in and take your vote away from them because 
they weren't disciplined. Think about that. Seriously. That's what Israel had to deal with. Folks, the Lord's local, visible, New Testament, autonomous, ecclesia or assembly, which is here in Buchanan, have the same responsibility to God that Israel did. Israel had a purpose. That was to deliver the message to God's chosen. And what did they do? They made their own laws and made God's law to coordinate with their laws. And they demanded of the people what they wanted and not what God wanted done. And brother, I'm going to tell you something. It's happening in the Lord's churches today. And it's happening in all churches outside of the Lord's churches as well. When the Lord's churches start going along with society and forgetting that they belong to God, they're required to stand by the standards of God that sets instead of those that society sets, God will deal with that body as he did with Israel. We must ask ourselves this. Number one, am I contributing to the work and the success of the Lord's plan or am I contributing to the failure of the Lord's work and plan and thus contributing to Satan's work and plan? Would you like for me to repeat that again? I think I will. Am I contributing to the work and success of the Lord's plan or am I contributing to the failure of the Lord's work and plan and thus contributing to Satan's work and plan? Now, that's for me to ask myself and that's for you to ask yourself. Where do you stand? Where do I stand? Listen to what the Lord said in Jeremiah. The Lord was talking to Jeremiah and they were dealing with a lot of things. And God was fed up. And in Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 16, now listen to this. He's talking about God's people. Israel. Therefore, he told Jeremiah, do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, because I will not hear you. If you're not going to deal with it yourself, then don't expect God to do your work for you. Jeremiah 14, 10 to 12. Therefore, do not pray for this people. Don't lift up a cry or a prayer for them. Don't make intercession for them. For I am not going to hear you. Thus, they have loved to wander. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. He will remember their iniquity now and punish their sins. Speaking of God's people. Church members need to stop and think about this. Oh, you can go and pray, Lord, oh, bless our church, give us new people, and then go out there and live your way and then expect God to bless the church. It's not going to happen. We can allow all that's going on out there with church members and not stop it so that people see us and what they're doing. And God's not going to bless as long as we allow it to go on. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. He will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. Then the Lord said to me, don't pray for these people. He says it again. Three times. For their God 
When they fast, I'm not going to hear their cry. When they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I'm not going to accept them. But I will consume them by a sword, by the famine, and by pestilence. Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death. You know, there is a death because of sin. You can go so far with God and he'll say, that's it, I've had enough. You know what, he can say that to a church. You're slaves to whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Do you want victory? Do you see where I got to that? Do you want victory? Or do you want failure? My last verse for the night. Revelation chapter 2 verse 5. Finally, another question we all need to ask ourselves as members of one of the Lord's New Testament churches is simply this. Are we as the Lord's local, visible, autonomous bodies at this point, are we heading in the direction that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 2, verse 5? Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I can't add anything to that. Brethren, the choice is ours. We need to ask ourselves do we want victory or do we want failure? What am I going to see when I leave this life? What are we as a church going to see when the Lord raptures us away from here? Will we hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Or will it be words of shame? The choice is ours. Let's stand forward to prayer. Frank, would you dismiss this, please? <clears throat>